We're in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Appreciate that worship team. Appreciate the the music and appreciate the time of prayer and reflection, and that's really, really important. We were just talking the other day, uh, church, about uh, with, with some volunteers and some of our partners in the ministry about uh, how, how important uh, prayer is, and one of us was actually reflecting, you know, when we don't take a, a time of prayer and just stop and do what we've done here, sometimes you just come in feeling like you're so rushed and there's so much on, on your shoulders and, uh, and your, your mind can be filled with things, and it's essential. There's a reason God set his house to be called a house of prayer, so uh, I appreciate the time that's taken when we just truly seek the Lord from our heart and invite him to search us and to fill us, and I'm excited about what he has for us tonight from his word in Acts chapter 20. So as we're studying Acts, we're now 20 chapters in. When we began meeting here at the Haskell House, we studied the early church, the first 12 chapters. Now we've come back uh, a year later, and we're studying the missionary journeys. And as I'm going through this, and as we're teaching this, as you're listening, hopefully lots of connections are starting to happen as you're seeing what's being spoken about in the different letters uh, that Paul writes and the journey that he takes through the book of Acts. So we've already covered the first missionary journey to Galatia, and uh, of course he wrote the book of Galatians there, and they were fighting against legalism, and the Jews were trying to make the Gentiles Jews before they could be saved. So we see that reflected in the book of Galatians. Then we, we talked about his uh, second missionary journey, the, the, the trip that was his call to Macedonia. Also some travel uh, that took place uh, down to Achaia. And remember, uh, the capital of Achaia is Corinth. So that was primarily what he was doing down there in Achaia. Uh, so in, in that trip to Macedonia, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's writing books like First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, and and he's making trips to Philippi and, and Corinth, of course, and, and Berea. And uh, just as he's, as he's coming along this, he's, he's forming disciples, he's planting churches. There are new believers who are growing in Christ. And, uh, and, and Paul is developing this really deep heart. He doesn't look for just converts in the city and leave. A piece of his heart stays with the people uh, who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to follow after him. And they're following Jesus at great cost. These are not cities that are uh, friendly to the Christian faith. Uh, It's filled with idolatry and uh, and immorality and corruption. So these believers are wading through some really difficult times, and Paul has a heart for them. So now Paul has started the third missionary journey, which is primarily to the province of Asia, and and most of his work is going to be done uh, in Ephesus during this time, Uh, and, and he's He's going to be writing 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans during this trip. Uh, and, and as he's going to these different places, I, I want you to just start to see some connections that are being made. And every single journey that he takes, he's going back and he's strengthening the believers. He's working with the disciples. He's making sure that they're staying on the course and helping them with the, the, the issues that are arising in the church and trying to keep the churches healthy and keep the disciples' eyes fixed on Jesus. So we're going to see that happening today uh, in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 12. So I want to just start with verse 1. It says, when the uproar was over, we remember last week we talked about the riot that took place in Ephesus. So when that's all done now, uh, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. So we're going to see that encouragement has a huge uh, theme for tonight, and we're going to spend some time on that. And I also want you to point to, to see that word believers. If we were to take the Greek word methetes, is, is what that is, it means disciple, literally. So these were disciples. These were people who had answered the call to follow Jesus with all of their heart. They had forsaken their lives. Jesus was the treasure of their heart. They were chasing after him. So they had believed on him in a life-changing way. And now they were doing this together. So as Paul is leaving and heading for Macedonia, he's got some uh, objectives in mind, uh, some very clear outcomes he wants. Number one, he wants to encourage the believers. We see that right here in the text. Number two, we pick up from clues uh, in his writings and letters that he wants to meet Titus in Troas. 
Uh, and there's a reason for that, and we'll talk about that. And he also wants to collect offerings for Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was undergoing some financial hardships. The believers there were suffering. So all these other churches that had been planted wanted to help that church and those believers as they were going through this hard time. So it was a time where the churches were coming together and learning how to love one another even beyond their own local churches. So something really healthy is taking place here. So like I said, we're gonna talk about encouraging the believers here in a little bit, uh, which is his clear objective. I I want to show you what happens uh, when he is looking to meet Titus. Uh, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians. He's looking for Titus in Troas, though he doesn't find him. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 12, says, When I came to the city of Troas to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. But I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus hadn't yet arrived with a report from you. So I said goodbye and went to Macedonia to find him. So back in Acts right now, in Acts chapter 20, Paul is actually in Troas, and this this door of opportunity we're going to read about tonight, it's actually that that old story where someone fell out of a window while Paul was preaching really late into the night, and Paul had to go down and resuscitate him and, uh, and, and bring him back to life. I guess he didn't resuscitate him. The Lord brought him back. But it was quite, a, quite an event, so he had a, an opportunity to really speak a lot of truth and proclaim the power of Christ in this place. But it's interesting, as he's writing to the Corinthians, he said, I had no peace of mind because my dear brother Titus hadn't yet arrived with a report for you. See, Paul really had a love for these disciples and these believers, these friends that he was making along the way. When is the last time that when you laid down your head in your bed at the end of the day that you had no peace of mind in your heart because of your love for another believer who is going through a difficulty, a difficult time, a deep trial? You know, this this spirit has to come back to the church We have to get back to that place where we talked about the value of loving one another deeply from Romans 12. And this is the way they live. So Paul, in the midst of all he had going on, was moved deeply with concern for his brother Titus. Now he does find them in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, just a page over here in my Bible. Uh, Starting in verse 5, he says, When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We face conflict from every direction with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. I like how he writes that. But God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. When he met his good friend and fellow disciple, his partner in the gospel, his heart was encouraged even though he was facing so much conflict. To the point that he he describes his situation to to the the church in Corinth as he was facing battles on the outside and fear on the inside. I was just talking to someone tonight before this uh, service got started, and they were just overwhelmed with everything that life keeps hitting them with. And, And I think some of us could really say amen to battles on the outside and fear on the inside. This is just life as some of us have learned to live it, but there is strength as we walk this journey with other believers. That's why it's so important that we love one another and we help carry one another and we encourage one another. We need that. So when Paul sees that Titus is there and he's doing well, he is deeply encouraged and his, his troubles fade away to the background. And then, of course, in his response, as Titus brings the report from Corinth, he writes this very letter, Second Corinthians. Now, Paul was also collecting that special offering for Jerusalem in this third missionary journey. And I just, I just want to read to you a couple of these things in, in the, the letters because I want you to be able to make some connections here as we're studying what's happening in Acts. All right, so I won't bog you down too much with this kind of information, but I do want those connections to form in your mind. So in 1 Corinthians 16, he talks about this offering he's collecting says, now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave the churches in Galatia. On the first day of the week, 
You should each put aside a portion of money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. So I want in your mind, as you're listening to this, Paul is collecting money for the church in Jerusalem who's experiencing hardship. He goes back to that whole sw- that, that sweep from his first missionary journey uh, to Galatia. So he's, he's hitting Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and uh, all these different places, Lystra, Derby, and he's taking up a collection from them. He also mentions this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. So just listen now. Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. Well, this is his, the churches that were planted in his second missionary journey. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. So they gave very sacrificially to this need And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and to encourage you to finish this ministry of giving Since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. It's interesting that Paul is measuring the genuineness of these churches' love based on their sacrificial giving for other believers who are in need. Finally, he says uh, in this passage, 2 Corinthians 8, down here in verse 11, uh, he says, give in proportion to what you have, and whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. So Paul's teaching a little bit about generosity. It's a gauge on, on our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we give, we give them to proportion to what we have. In other words, uh, Paul doesn't want them to give so much that they're, that they're now without why those in Jerusalem are, are doing better. He wants them just to give a portion of what they have and to give it eagerly, to give it with a heart of love. And he says, if they can do this, it tests, they pass the test of love. We ought to be looking for those opportunities in our Christian circles to meet material and physical needs of one another. Our brothers and sisters of Christ not, should not be going without if we are able to step in and help them. Now, whenever it comes to the topic of giving to those who are in need, it should come down a little more holistically than just throwing money at a problem. We need to sit down sometimes and actually talk through, well, how did we get to this point and what can we do to prevent this from happening in the future? Because we certainly don't want to create an unhealthy dependence, but we also do as a church want to meet legitimate needs uh, that come up. This is a measure of our love. So we, we see this happening here, and he, even one last place that, uh, that I would point you to uh, is in Romans 15, and then I'll, uh, I'll conclude here about the giving that was going on. But in Romans 15, verse 25, it says this, But before I come, I must also go to Jerusalem to give a gift to the believers there. For you see the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, remember that's basically Corinth, have eagerly taken up an offering to the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. They were glad to do this because they feel they owe a real debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel the least they can do in return is to help them financially. As soon as I delivered this money and complete this good deed of theirs, I will come and see you on my way to Spain." So let me just pause because I want you to see what actually happened here. Paul, as he's moving out from the church in Jerusalem, which was a, a Jewish church, in the first missionary journey, they were, they were kind of, you know, and again, the first 12 chapter, chapters of Acts, it's this giant revelation from God that Gentiles are too now being brought in through the call of the gospel. 
which to the Jews, this was a massive transition. It was hard for them to process. But they did, and they received it with joy when the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles and made it very clear that God was working in them too, and the church was to spread to them. I want you to see now the appreciation that the Gentiles had as their churches are now being planted all over. They have this appreciation towards the church in Jerusalem for sending someone to them. They, they, t they had enough care to just send someone out into the lostness of these cities so that they could have an opportunity to believe in Christ. So they had this affection towards the church in Jerusalem simply for their act of, of missional gospel intentionality. So I, I believe God does a lot when we begin to obey the mission of the gospel. There is going to be, uh, there is going to be a blessing that comes out of that, especially when we begin to see people responding to the gospel. We see their lives changed and, and relationships uh, are built there. So let's go back to uh, that first thing we, that we mentioned. Paul is on a mission here and he is encouraging the disciples. So back to Acts chapter 20. And I'll start in verse 2. I'll read down to verse 5. While there, he encouraged the believers in the towns he passed through. Then he traveled down to Greece, where he had stayed for three months. And again, that's talking about, <laughs> in Greece is Achaia, and, and down there is Corinth. He was preparing to sail back to Syria when he discovered a plot by some Jews against his life. So he decided to run through, uh, return through Macedonia. Several men were traveling with him. They were Sopater, son of Paris, from Berea, Aristarchus, and Secondus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derby, Timothy, who was from Lystra, and Tychius, and Trophimus from the province of Asia. They went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. So again, in verse 2, it says that he is encouraging the believers, or encouraging the disciples, literally, is what that word says. And this word encourage is a unique one it's the same word that is used back in john chapter 14 verse 16 for the holy spirit paraklesos does that sound familiar familiar to some of you uh, the the holy spirit is called the paraclete and to encourage is paraklesos same root word so this word is used here in John 14, 16, and, he, and Jesus is speaking here. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, paraklesos, or paraclete, who will never leave you. So I just want to talk about this word encouragement, because this is what Paul was so uh, invested in. As he was exhorting, as he was encouraging, and exhort is kind of like, uh, exhort would be the best translation, but it's not a real familiar word to us, but it, exhort, exhortation is like encouragement with some bite to it, uh, encouragement with, with some strength behind it. It's, it's more like a challenge. I, I want you to step up to this. So uh, it's, it's more than just encouragement by, by saying, well, you look nice today. Uh, it, it's much deeper than that. It's, it's pushing someone, filling their spirit, and m helping them to press on uh, to the challenge. So we, we see Paul doing this, and I want us to really look into our own hearts. As, as part of a church family, it's really, really important that we learn how to exhort each other, to, to, ch to encourage one another. We have to encourage each other constantly because, let's be honest, our, our hearts they wander. Sometimes we need to be strongly encouraged by another disciple of Jesus Christ. Sin never sleeps. The battle is always there. We have an enemy constantly working against us, so we need to be constantly encouraging one another with the scriptures. The gospel remains a priority. You know, if we don't encourage one another and press each other like Paul pressed those disciples in his ministry, we can almost lose sight of the gospel and just start running some kind of organization. We need to be constantly pushing each other. What are we doing to get the gospel outside of these walls? What are we doing to take the gospel to the people in our lives? 
I love the definition of a church that says that a church is a group of baptized believers in Jesus Christ that meet together regularly to hear from God and who take the gospel to the people in their lives. I really believe those are the core elements of a church. If a group is meeting together and they're just studying the Bible, but they're never taking the gospel out to the people in their lives, that's not even close to a reflection of what we had in the first century. That's not a reflection of the early church. These people were learning from the scriptures so they could take it out and apply it and take uh, the message of hope to a lost and very dark world. When we encourage each other, we, we fan each other's passion for the king that we serve. We have to constantly be looking for opportunities to do this for one another because it doesn't take long for one heart to kind of grow a little bit cold if it's not interacting with other believers, if it's not joining alongside others and carrying the, the gospel ministry forward. It's a very, very important work that we see Paul doing here. So the question comes up, let's get practical here. How do we encourage one another? Because it's more than just a verbal arrangement. And the reason that we just walked through what we walked through in the epistles, in the letters, and not just looking at Acts, is because we're seeing how Paul is carrying this out. Number one, we encourage each other when we give to one another. We just saw that Paul taking that offering to all these different churches, uh, from the, the churches to Jerusalem. We do the same way. When you encourage someone when you actually meet a physical need, when you give up something that you have, whether it's a, a possession, whether it's material, whether it's money or something like that, and you meet a legitimate need, you care enough about somebody else to actually make that happen. Some of us have encouraged others in this family that specific way. Others of us have received encouragement from this church family in that way. And when it's done with no strings attached, and when it's received well, it, it can be done, and it, it can be a very God-honoring thing, and it can encourage, it can lift each other's spirits. We know that we're not facing the challenges and the, tri the trials here alone. So giving is a very practical way to encourage. Beyond that, visiting one another. Spending time with one another is essential. Uh, we, we talked, uh, in, when we were in Romans 12, talking about God's house family rules, his expectations. Remember where we talked about loving one another sincerely and honoring each other and all the, that, that study that we did in there. Part of that in verse 13, Romans 12, 13 says, when people are in need, be ready to help. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Not only are we meeting each other's needs, but we're actually spending time with one another. We're visiting with one another. So we, we have a time for that before and after our services, but I want to encourage you to get into each other's homes as well, to spend time getting to know each other. That's what hospitality is all about. Have someone over for dinner. Meet someone somewhere for coffee. Talk to people. Get to know them. Spend time. Do you notice how Paul, on every missionary journey he took, he's always going back and stopping and spending time and longing to see those disciples that had made commitments for Christ face to face. He wanted to build into them. He wanted to see them. And for Paul, he was traveling hundreds and hundreds of miles by foot to make that happen. He saw it. Is that important? We have vehicles, and, and we're all within a few miles of each other. So this is, this is something very meaningful that takes place. This is how we encourage each other. So we give, we visit, and finally we serve with each other. These are very practical ways. We, we serve with one another, and we're actually gonna focus on what that looks like when I go back to our passage in Acts 20 because we just read this long list of weird-sounding names in Acts 20, verse four, of these people that were traveling with Paul and they were from Thessalonica and Berea and Lystra and all these different places. They were representatives from all those different churches that were, one, I'm sure, helping him carry the offering so that he didn't get mugged, but they were also partners in ministry. They were encouraging him, and, they, and Paul was building into them. So before I get there, when we're talking about encouraging one another, 
I, I want to challenge you with this. I would, I would say honestly, from what I've seen in churches, we're not necessarily really good at this. Well, churches struggle just a little bit when it comes to encouraging one another effectively. So why might that be? Why is this a struggle? Well, here's, here's some reasons that come to my mind. Number one is we think that we're too busy. You know, I, I would spend time with other believers, I would do some things with people, I, but you know, I'm just, I am so busy. But I wanna push against that just a little bit because I want you to think for a moment what the Apostle Paul's schedule might have looked like. He's planting church after church after church. He's got people on his tail. He's got every, all these things going on. He's got a very tight schedule, and yet he's making time to encourage the saints. I think we also struggle because we're so self-absorbed. Sometimes we don't even give thought to encouraging somebody else. Sometimes we spend too much time scratching our own head thinking, well, why doesn't somebody care about me? Of course, the Bible tells us that there is this principle of reaping and sowing. When you be, if you need more care in your own life, you need to start showing care to others because it'll come back. But we have to be careful, especially in our culture, that we don't become so self-absorbed that we just don't even think about encouraging other disciples in their walk. And, and finally, I, I think the, the real root of the problem, and, and you hear me come back to this a lot, is, is just the failure to love one another effectively, genuinely. We love our plans, we love ourselves, we love our comforts, we love our free time. We don't wanna get involved in somebody else's mess. But yet, we must take the time to encourage one another. You know, I, I, I appreciate uh, the time that, that Barb spends uh, when she comes into uh, our time of worship, the songs that have been selected, the prayer time. She spends hours and hours praying over that and preparing for that so that it will be a meaningful time for the church family, so that she would be an encouragement to you. Uh, I appreciate seeing those types of things. Even um, I saw something happen from my, my daughter, Sydney, that, that impressed me. Uh, how you doing there, Sido? Imagine this. So she's reflecting on how she's spending her time, and we talk about this a lot, and she recognizes that maybe she's spending too much time on her iPad. So I've given her an iPad, however, I've set parental controls on that thing, so my kids get up to two hours uh, on that, and then, then the stuff sh all shuts down. So Sydney comes to me today, and she says, Dad, I want you to take my iPad time down to one hour. She says, I think I'm spending too much time on screen time and I, I wanna make better decisions with my time. Well, these are the kinds of decisions that we need, you know what, adults, adults. We would do well for some of us to say, I need to set my phone down and not spend so much time on this thing and start spending that time doing what the Bible says, engaging other people. I imagine this, you ever get those weekly screen time reports? All right, you know what I'm talking about? How awesome would it be if at the end of the week the screen time report that you see said that that's how many hours you had spent encouraging the saints in God's kingdom? But you know what, all right, so some of you are getting, you know the screen times reports, they're like three hours a day, four hours a day, I don't know what they are on your phone. What if we were spending that kind of time investing in God's kingdom? But imagine if God asked, if someone asked you, I would like to ask you to spend the kind of time that you're spending on your phone in the kingdom of God. How much time are you talking? How about three hours a day? I don't have three hours a day to be doing that. Yet we find that time to entertain ourselves. We find that time to unwind ourselves. Be careful about being self-absorbed. Be careful about guarding our schedule, our free time, so much that we have no time to be investing in one another. We have to be very, very careful about this. Listen to this verse from Jesus in Matthew 24, 46. Write that down somewhere in your margin because this is really important. 
Now, before I read this verse from Jesus, remember what it is that Jesus commanded us to do. The Great Commission is that we are going to occupy our time, our energy, our efforts, our resources, our strategic thinking. We're gonna work together to make disciples. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and I am commanding you to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And remember, as you're doing this, I am going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. So he gives us clear commands. This is the work you're to be doing. And then he says something crazy like this in Matthew 24, 46. Blessed is that servant whom, when his master comes is found so doing. What do you think the odds would be if Jesus had returned in the Apostle Paul's lifetime that Jesus would have actually found Paul engaging in the gospel ministry? What do you think the odds are? Pretty good. That man was like obsessed with getting the gospel out, encouraging the saints, keeping the churches healthy, and planting new churches. He was an animal for the kingdom of God. So just for a moment, would you reflect on your own life and your own schedule and habits with the gospel? What are the odds that if Jesus returns in our lifetime, he will find you so doing the work that he's commanded us to do? What's the odds? Now, let me just be honest. If I'm a betting man, Jesus is going to find his church checking Facebook. Well, I did like a scripture verse on Facebook. (laughs) I don't think that's what Jesus meant when he said, follow me. I'm, I'm talking about God is looking for servants who are giving away significant chunks of their life, their freedom, their energy, and their resources to expand the kingdom of God as though they were willing to pour out their own life that God's objectives and desires would be met. But where are those people? See, that's what I'm praying that God is going to do in in this little group of believers, that there would be disciples formed here because what I'm so afraid of is God's church in the West isn't producing anything like that. We're, We're seeing Christianity take on this different form where Yet we want a good inspirational speech on a Sunday morning. We want some great sounding music. We want to leave happy, challenged, but hey, when we leave, we leave. We're done. Now we have a very busy week. Thanks for the wind and the sails. Back to my life now. God isn't asking for that. Jesus, in his original call, said that we must deny our lives, that we are walking away from all of that that we pursued before we found Christ, and now Christ becomes our great obsession, and his mission becomes our mission. Like, I wanna keep wrestling with that, church, until that becomes a reality where when, when Jesus returns, quite possibly in our lifetimes, very, very good chance that that's going to happen. I really believe that, that he would find a great deal of this church family actually engaging in the gospel and not just busy about their own kingdoms, and not just chasing after their own affairs. Jeff, did you wind that clock way forward? Because that says 6.53, and that can't possibly be. (laughs) Oh, Matt's in charge of that, and he left. All right, we'll, we'll blame him. He left. All right, let me get back here to Acts 20, verse 4. I want you to see this. I think this is really important. It says here that several men were traveling with him, and I already read the list of names, and I'd read them to you again, but I find them very hard to pronounce, so you can read verse 4 for yourself, and you're seeing representation from Berea and Thessalonica, Derby, Lystra, Asia, primarily uh, probably Ephesus uh, right there. And And we have to ask ourselves, as Paul is working with this group of men and he's encouraging them, he's mentoring them, he's discipling them, he's equipping these partners that he has in ministry. And I want you to write down in your margin 2 Timothy 2.2. 2 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. This is, and I'll even read verse 1 to give you a little context. And remember, 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul wrote. He knew this was the end. He says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now listen to this, church. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. See, Paul wanted to make disciples who could make disciples themselves. You'll hear me talk about this a lot here because we are going to obsess over this because this is the mission that Jesus gave to us. I have made a disciple with my life when I have invested in someone to the degree that they are capable of making a disciple themselves and they're doing that. You have made a disciple with your life when you have invested in someone so much that they are able to not only follow Jesus and know the scriptures to some degree, but they are also pouring into somebody else to, that, to, to make a disciple who can make a disciple. Paul was a disciple maker. Listen to those words again. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. I want to give you four fast keys of being an effective disciple maker because I pray over this church, I pray over your faces that you will be effective in doing this. Number one, the first key of being an effective disciple maker is reproducibility. Reproducibility. Our end goal in discipleship is replication, that someone else can do it. Now, now let me give you an example. Uh, I use this book. I'm actually discipling two men right now. I'm going to tell you what I do, just to put some sneakers on this thing. I use this book. It's from uh, Greg Ogden. I reviewed a whole mess of different discipleship resources. This guy, in my opinion, nails it. There's other good ones out there, and you don't have to use a book. I love this. In fact, with, my, with the two guys that I'm investing in right now, we are halfway through. So we've, we've done three months. This is a six-month program. We meet once a week. We meet on Tuesday nights. And I can tell you it's, it's work. Like, I have a family, and Tuesday nights are busy. But we have to set time if we're going to actually get involved in making disciples. And we actually put an emphasis on getting to the point in training where these two men have committed that when we're done, they're going to go do this with someone else. I mean, it's, we're, we're, we're working on this together. Now, when I say reproducibility, I don't mean repeatability. It, it doesn't mean that, that you have to do this exactly the way that I do it which is why I don't have a discipleship program for each of you that says, if you want to make a disciple, you have to go get this book and do exactly what I'm doing. I just want you investing in other people. Now, you can use this book, and you can do what I'm doing, but you can do whatever you want to do, but get out there and do it. Invest in people, train them, and, and take that step to the point, and this takes a lot of investment, get them to the point where they can be doing this as well. So that's the first key. The second key to being an effective disciple maker is, is community. And I've heard it stated this way, and I like it. Think circles, not rows. Not a classroom. Even what I'm doing right now, this is not discipleship making. I'm preaching. I'm giving you the tools, but I can tell you I can preach and preach and preach and never produce a disciple. I can preach a lot and, and see people grow in their knowledge of the scriptures, but through my preaching, I've noticed it's, it's just casting the net a little too wide. I hope it blesses you. I hope it strengthens your spirit, but most likely, I'm not gonna replicate myself real effectively in this kind of environment. I have to, on top of what I'm doing, get a much smaller group to where I can really pour into them specifically uh, with a lot of focus. So you might be a teacher, and that's fine. The, the church needs teachers. But that's not necessarily the same thing as discipleship making. When I'm in a discipleship environment, it's conversational, it's communal. Uh, we're all looking at each other's faces, giving input, and, and training together. So think community. Not a class, not a program, not a sermon, not a lesson. 
not a video, not a curriculum, but actually getting together, and, and the Bible becomes the textbook. So that would be my third thing, is using a Bible to seek Jesus. The key is using the Bible as the textbook to seek Jesus. It's, it's critical that everything that we learn, we're learning that this right here is God's word, it's God's truth, it's God's authority, God breathed, and this is what directs the life of a disciple, nothing else. And yes, you will get severe kickback for this in our culture. This is not a respectable book in our culture. But it wasn't in the time when the Apostle Paul was preaching it either. So we're not alone there. Whoops, I just lost my place. There we go. So we need to be reproducible. We need to be doing this in small communities. We need to be basing it on the Word of God, on the Bible. And, and finally, uh, this one might surprise you, but you have to be intentionally discipling somebody. Okay, so here's, here's the point I'm making. If you don't decide in your own mind for yourself that you are going to take the great commandment, the great commission that Jesus gave you, which is to make disciples, if you don't take that giant step and say, I am going to make disciples. I am going to do something. I'm going to make this effort. And however it looks, it might not look exactly like what Pastor John does, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to make an effort. And it's going to take time that you feel that you don't have. It's going to take a commitment that you feel is too much for you to make. But you're going to make that step by faith and pray that God is, and you are going to invest in people and it's work but you're gonna make disciples that way. And until you do that, I've never seen a disciple made accidentally. Oh my goodness, I just produced a disciple. I've never seen it happen. It's a lot of work. So I wanna encourage you guys, disciple making is not for professional ministry people. I, I don't see professional ministry people anywhere in these pages, just to be honest. Normal people carry the gospel passionately. They encourage one another, and off they go. All right, so I have to get back to our, I'm going to finish this quickly. You ready? Back to Acts chapter 20. So let me get to the second half, verse 6. So after the Passover ended, we boarded a ship at Philippi in Macedonia, and five days later joined them in Troas, where we stayed a week. We talked about Paul looking for Titus and Troas. Didn't happen. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share the Lord's Supper. Pause. Uh, on the first day of the week, this is the, the earliest evidence that Christians were now not meeting on the Sabbath. What day is the Sabbath again? Yes, yeah, Saturday. It's not Sunday. Saturday is the Sabbath. But now these Christians are meeting on the first day of the week. And we can, we can speculate because that's when the resurrection took place. We gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. So this is interesting. This was on a Sunday, not a Saturday, and it was at night. Now, it's interesting. This was an evening service, and I'm not making this point because we meet in the evenings, but it's a nice coincidence. Uh, scholars believe that they were meeting, the early church was often meeting on Sunday nights because, let's get our minds out of Western culture, Sundays were a work day. Saturdays, the Jews often took off, but Sundays, people were working all day, so they were oftentimes meeting in churches after work was over. They were coming together, and they were having dinner together because they had spent the day working to survive. So this was a normal practice in the early church. And it says, Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he talked until midnight. The upstairs room where, he was, uh, where they met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, do you think Luke meant to write it that way? I mean, did he know that this was like going into the Bible? Paul is speaking on and on. A young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. So surely the application point in this section is don't fall asleep during church, right? 
In fact, Amy, I was just talking to you. You're going on three hours of sleep from last night, and you just happen to be in the balcony, so be very careful up there. So he falls to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, took him into his arms, says, don't worry. He said, he's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, shared in the Lord's Supper, and ate together. There's a lot going on at this church service. They're having the Lord's Supper. Someone fell out of a third-story window and died. Paul revives them. You know, you ever have one of those crazy services? You, you know what, Pete? It reminds me of the, uh, the uh, church picnic incident in 2021. Uh, we had something similar to this. Maybe not quite as drastic happen. But sometimes these things happen. And it says, Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. So I know I'm going too long, but hey, I'm not pushing it that far. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Let me, let me end with this. Paul's business here was he was going everywhere he could to encourage the believers, the disciples that were a fruit of his ministry. Encouragement is a big deal. Us taking time out of our busy lives, and I know you're busy, to encourage the people around you to get busy in great commission work, to get the gospel out to the people in our lives. It's a group effort. And if we don't do this, we can just kind of go through the motions and end up just meeting on Sunday nights and then going back to our normal lives and meeting on Sunday nights, going back to our normal lives and not really kind of having the kingdom impact that God intends for us to have. So I want to encourage you to really take this to heart and if we're to be an encouragement to one another really watch out commit in your heart that you will not be a source of discouragement to one another now I'm speaking to all the adults down here but we've got a lot of kids up here in the balcony so kids can you tune in on me just for a moment because I'm going to close with this and I remember God speaking to me when I was in college, just I was a young man, and he was really challenging me to get, uh, to really walk closely with him in my faith. I'll tell you what, kids, come right on here to the, uh, come out here where I can see you. Can you come up to the, like, the edge of the balcony? There we go. Yeah, I want to talk to you guys for a minute. Very cool. There's a bunch of you up there. So, When I was in college, God was talking to me, and I wanted to follow him with all of my heart, and here's what he told me, here's what he revealed to my heart. So I was actually some of your age, like the older people up there, I was your age, but here's the truth I want you to hear, is until you learn to live this way in your own home, If you're not living this way at your house, then everything that you're doing outside your home is just kind of putting on a show for everybody else. So when God really challenged me, he challenged me in this way. He says, if you're gonna start to walk the way I want you to walk, how are you talking to your sister at home? I was really mean to my sister. I mean, I don't know how you guys are to your siblings. I was was a big brother and I was really good at it, okay? (laughs) A little too good at it. So God challenged me and he says, "I I don't want you to talk to your sister that way anymore. And then beyond that, he said, the way that you talk to your mom and your dad, it's a problem. I want you to start living the way that I'm telling you to, like as I'm telling everybody in here to start treating each other with respect, to start to to encourage each other to be on the same team, it's got to start in your home before it can be a reality out here or we're all playing games. Are you following me? So there's actually some radical stuff that can actually start here in this church when our young people start demonstrating it in their homes. And I wanna challenge you to do that. How do you treat your brothers and sisters? How do you talk to your mom and your dad? How do you carry out your assignments when you don't feel like doing them? And God says when we start being an encouragement in our homes, And when we're a discouragement, we're we're talking about when we're harsh towards one another, when we're critical, when we're angry, when we're disrespectful, there's no room for that at home. And when we start living as encouragers in our home, instead of living that way, when the disrespect leaves and we start respecting each other deeply and loving each other, caring for each other in our homes, our homes begin to change 
and our church begins to change. It's really radical stuff. And I just want you guys to understand, you play a really big role in this. You really do. This is for you as well. All right, so thanks for being good sports. Thanks for coming out to the edge there for me. So church, as, as we close here, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. When we start carrying this out in our homes, it gets a lot more real here. It's, in, in each of us, listen, it's not all gonna happen magically at your house either. One person has to decide to take the first step, to be the encourager, to be respectful, to be loving, to turn the other cheek, to do all of this stuff. It starts at home, it carries on through our church family, and as we take the gospel out to the people in our community and in our lives, people start to notice there's something different about us. All right, so I just wanna challenge you with that tonight. I hope you've been encouraged. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, we have a mission in front of us worth living for, even worth dying for. And God, I'm asking that you would help us not be so self-absorbed because we are. Even I am, God. Help us to become absorbed with the gospel and the work of the kingdom and a passion for our king. Give us that, God. Beyond that, God, I pray that as we learn to love you more and more deeply, that we are willing to let go of more and more things in this world that only serve us, that we would evaluate how we're using our time. We would evaluate what we are giving and spending our resources on, what, what we're accumulating and building into in this earth versus what we are building into in your kingdom. God, I pray that you would bring conviction to us for the amount of time that we spend on relaxing and comforts versus the amount of time we are building into the lives of other disciples who are on this journey with us. God, I pray over this church that you would help us to become disciples who make disciples. And God, that first step is that we must become the kind of disciple that Jesus called to himself, that we would abandon these lives and that you would become the treasure of our hearts and it would shape the way that we follow you. It would shape the way that we live our lives and that people would see that there's something different about those who have abandoned their lives to the cause of Jesus and to the person of Jesus. God, give us a deep, love for you and for each other. This world has got to see what it is that you've called us to and who else is gonna live it out. Do something special here, God, in this family. We want to be used by you. We invite you to pour us out for your glory. These lives are not our own. They belong to you. They've been bought with a price. And we gladly serve our King. Jesus, we are not ashamed of you, not in our schools, not in the workplace, not at home. Give us courage to take the gospel out. This is the, tr this is the message and the truth that has saved our very souls. And there are so many who need it. God, use this church family to make a difference in our community. Help us together to make the name of Jesus famous. And give us the courage and the backbone to stand against the attacks and the resistance that will inevitably take place when we take the gospel out. Make us strong, God. And help us to stand together. Help us to take seriously the ministry of encouragement like Paul did. As we close here tonight, it's so important that you reflect in your own heart. How are you living for Jesus? Are you living for Jesus? What changes do you need to make with your time? with your resources, with the people that you're investing in. 
Time is short, church. I believe that. What we do with each day matters. As we close tonight, I want you to take a hard look at your own heart. Are you the disciple that Jesus has called you to be? Have you had the conversation with God where you have told him you are no longer your own? You know, if you need to make a commitment to Christ tonight, if you've never made that commitment of faith, as we close in this moment, maybe you've heard this invitation, even from me, a hundred times. Take a hard look inside. If you need to make this commitment, make it tonight. Pray a prayer like this. And let it be the start of your journey. God, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I have been living for me. But tonight, I am changing that. Jesus, I am making you my Lord. And it is now you that I am going to live for. And I recognize it's going to radically change the way that I live. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross to take the penalty of my sin. I believe you rose again on the third day, just like the Bible says, so that I could receive new life. From this day forward, I will live for you. You are the treasure of my heart. There is nothing else that I am going to run after like the way I run after you, Jesus. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for saving my soul.